Yeah, that's that one. Yeah. Okay. How about this? Okay. You're welcome. Okay, thanks. Are you using the pen at all? No. Okay, um, we can start now, please. Okay, I'm gonna... Okay, so um, I'm gonna talk about connective tissues today. And um, you're gonna see relations between this and what we talked about yesterday, because connective tissues are very abundant in extracellular matrix. So just to start, uh, do a schematic of the epithelial tissue and its relation to the connective tissue. Here in a schematic view, and here in um, an actual microscopic section that the schematic was based on. <clears throat> so you can see the epithelial cells are connected <clears throat> to each other and the connect, um, connective tissue cells are separate from each other. The um, epithelial cells are sitting on a basement membrane, um, partly produced by the epithelium, partly produced by the connective tissue. Um, the connective tissue cells, mainly fibroblasts, are surrounded by extracellular matrix. And, um, um, you should, and blood vessels in the connective tissue. You don't have blood vessels in the epithelium. Okay, so <clears throat> here's a, another schematic, and we're gonna concentrate on this part today. So in the, ec in the matrix of the connective tissue, there are fibrous components, and there are amorphous components. The amorphous components are things that you mainly won't see in a lab in the light um, microscope, um, but it's water and proteoglycans and glycoproteins. The fibers you sometimes see if they're um, highly organized and um, not scattered. So um, fibers can be very densely packed or they can be loosely packed and um, if they're loosely packed, uh, the ratio of cells to fibers is greater. So let's look at this um, chart. So we have connective tissues of different kinds. Um, this so-called connective tissue proper, which is what we're gonna mainly be concerned with. And that's organized into loose and dense, as I, as I mentioned. L um, loose has a higher proportion of cells lower proportion of fibers. Dense is uh, very rich in fibers, and the fibers can be randomly arranged or they can be um, very well organized and oriented in one direction. <clears throat> so why would you have those two arrangements? Well, um, if, if you have a connective tissue that is surrounding an organ, so let's look at the spleen or the lymph node. The organ is more or less uh, round or, or spherical, and um, whatever um, pressure is generated inside has to be kind of dissipated in all directions. Okay, so um, something that is um, kind of evenly arranged normally has a kind of what's called an irregular connective tissue. So you find the capsule of the liver, the capsule of the spleen, capsule of lymph nodes. The, um, if you look at the um, 
surrounding tissue of cartilage or bone. They have a connective tissue surrounding them. The connective tissue has fibers that are randomly organized. But there are certain cases where all of the tension on the tissue is in one direction. So for example, a tendon will attach the end of a bone to the end of a muscle. And it only gets pulled in one direction. There's very little pre um, uh, tension put on the tendon in the lateral direction. <clears throat> Similarly with a ligament. A ligament attaches two bones together. So all of the stress is in one direction. You find that the fibers in tissues like that, the collagen fibers mainly, are oriented all in the same direction. That's called a regular connective tissue. Now, there are some kind of um, regular but uh, changing in orientation. I showed you an example yesterday in the cornea of the eye. It was regular, but then it changed its orientation in the next layer. So that's a special case. Similarly with bone, we'll find the same kind of thing. The collagen is organized in a regular fashion, but then from layer to layer, the orientation of the fibers will change abruptly. <clears throat> so um, those are more or less regular connective tissues as well. Um, there are other kinds of connective tissues that we'll get to later in, the, uh, in this uh, talk. Um, the connective tissues with special properties, adipose tissue, elastic tissue, you heard a little bit about that. Um, now hematopoietic tissue, you're going to have a separate uh, lecture and lab on that. Those are, that's the tissue that produces blood cells. It's a fatty tissue with a lot of stem cells in the bone marrow. We won't talk about that today. And mucous tissue is another kind of, it's a rare case. Um, the umbilical cord is mucous tissue um, in some other kinds of organisms like the, the comb of, of chickens um, is, is mucous tissue. We, we won't uh, talk about that, but that's connective tissue with high levels of proteoglycan in the matrix. <clears throat> and then cartilage and bone I will be speaking to you about on Friday. And that is, um, those are skeletal connective tissues, um, highly specialized um, properties. So let's just focus on this to begin with and then get to some of this. So where are these tissues? So I said that dense, irregular connective tissue will be in the capsules of organs, but also the dermis of the skin, the thick layer <clears throat> of the skin um, that is really the, um, uh, the part of the skin with the mechanical um, uh, properties that are important. The skin has to be able to stretch in all directions, and so it needs to have an irregular connective tissue. If, it, if the fibers were too lined up in the dermis uh, to one of the axes of the body, if you kind of pushed in another direction, you might tear the dermis. So it has to be um, what's called uh, anisotropic, uh, organized in many different directions. Um, and the submucosa of the digestive tube, um, I'll show you some pictures of this, but that is a layer of dense connective tissue that is um, uh, kind of deep beneath the layer of the villi and uh, the glandular the digestive tube. Okay. Um, dense regular connective tissue, I mentioned tendons and ligaments. <clears throat> and then you have loose connective tissue. Loose connective tissue is always irregular. You don't never have regular loose connective tissue. So you have kind of a scant population of fibers. You have a lot of amorphous matrix and a fairly large population of cells. And they're not only connective tissue cells. So they're not only fibroblasts, but loose connective tissue can have resident cells with other functions. So they'll have immune cells, um, macrophages, and, and um, mast cells that um, uh, kind of ex uh, push out uh, granules that contain um, heparin and histamine that are involved in allergic reactions and so on, and, and um, wound, wound responses. Um, 
mesentery. Those are, are the kind of filmy connective tissues that attach the viscera to the body wall. And um, that has a lot of resident cells. And we'll get to that later. Okay. Elastic connective tissue, I mentioned yesterday. And we'll re revisit that a little today. The aorta and large arteries, the respiratory airways. So that has normal components of connective tissue, type 1 collagen, um, usually randomly arranged, and almost always, um, and then elastin as well. And if you have elastin, you always have what? Fibrillin. Okay. So, um, and then reticular connective tissue. Um, we'll revisit that. I mentioned the type 3 collagen yesterday. We'll see how this is organized um, um, in different parts of the, um, of the body. Okay. So this is a lineage diagram. And it's a little simplified because we know more than this now. But um, in the embryo, there's a population of cells that are the earliest connective tissue cells. They're called mesenchyme. And they are multipotent um, uh, or pluripotent. They have many different possibilities of differentiating. And um, uh, there's a, a lineage that's very productive. It gives rise to smooth muscle cells, which are not connective tissue. But it also gives rise to the fibroblasts of connective tissue. <clears throat> it gives rise to chondroblasts, which turn into cartilage, chondrocytes. It gives rise to osteoblasts, which turn into bone osteocytes. And it gives rise to adipocytes, adipose cells. And this is more complicated than this diagram shows, as I'll come back to later, because um, uh, fat is not just the simple um, white fat that is kind of the um, kind of the bane of the adult body, but um, there's something called brown fat, which is prevalent in the um, um, in, in the in infants and is present to some extent in adults and can actually be elicited um, by treatment with cold. And that is a fat that doesn't store energy. It doesn't store um, lipid in these large droplets, but it actually dissipates energy by um, turning um, fuel into heat. Okay, it's very important for generation of body heat, but also for um, keeping a person's weight down um, so that what you eat doesn't all get stored, but turns into heat. Okay. So let's look at the small intestine. We're going to be coming back to this later on in the term, but it is um, a site of several different kinds of connective tissue. Now, in the lab yesterday, or some of you today, will see the stomach. The stomach is part of the digestive system. Um, like the stomach uh, and like the small intestine, there's a layers of smooth muscle, the main wall of the digestive tube. We're not going to be talking about that today. Um, and then there is what's called the mucosa. In this case, in the small intestine, there are villi. And the villi are absorptive. And then beneath this mucosa is a submucosa. The submucosa is dense, irregular connective tissue. So the collagen in this layer is very abundant and randomly arranged. But inside each of the villi, they kind of look hollow here, but they're not hollow. They're filled with a loose connective tissue, which is called lamina propria. And that loose connective tissue has capillaries. It has a lymphatic. It has um, lymphocytes. It has, um, uh, of course, blood cells, since it has capillaries. And it has um, s uh, uh, several other kinds of resident cells. So it's a complex tissue. But it's mainly um, fibroblasts and the fibers they produce and the other matrix component. And the um, fibers are very sparse and they're randomly arranged. Okay. 
So you have two kinds of connective tissue. You have the loose connective tissue of the lamina propria filling each of these villi. And then you have the layer, the submucosa, which is the dense, irregular connective tissue. And then the rest of this is muscle. And then there's an outer layer also. There's a little connective tissue on the outside called the, um, the serosa. It's uh, covered by a mesothelium. Okay, so here's a schematic of the same thing. This will be easier to understand. So inside the villi is loose connective tissue. Here is the submucosa. So the epithelium and the loose connective tissue is called the mucosa or the mucous membrane. This is the submucosa. Then you have layers of muscle. Then you have the serosa, which is um, a, a kind of intermediate density connective tissue covered by mesothelium. Okay, so let's look more closely at the villus. So the villus has an epithelium, and Dr. Luria has shown you this epithelium several times because it's an unusual epithelium in that it has this, this um, striated border or brush border of, made up of microvilli. So the surface area of um, the villus is very much enhanced by those specializations. But if we move deeper from the epithelium, we have this loose connective tissue of the lamina propria. And we can see that there are blood vessels in here. Here are blood cells. We have um, the, the kind of white space. It's probably a lymphatic. And um, A are lymphocytes, and B are plasma cells. So why are they there? The, um, the gut is very um, assaulted by bacteria and everything you eat, everything from the outside. So there's a lot of immune surveillance going on at that interface. So there are lymphocytes in the lamina propria, and the lymphocytes can be stimulated to form plasma cells or antibody-forming cells. There are also lymphocytes that migrate through the um, um, epithelium and, and mediate uh, uh, T cell re uh, responses. So you have migratory lymphocytes. They, they traverse the epithelium. But the um, lamina propria is highly populated with different kinds of cells. And some of these cells are fibroblasts that are, have produced the connective tissue. Okay, now here's another view of connective tissue. So in the introduction to the um, learning modules, you heard about different kinds of stains. And one kind of stain, one class of stain, is called trichrome stains. And they're very good for collagenous connective tissues. The, um, they stain them blue-green. And what they're staining are the sugar moieties on the collagen. The, the stain is particularly suited to um, interacting with those and um, turning blue-green. And um, the, in the mammary gland, and this is a, a non-active um, mammary gland. It's quiescent. Um, it has two kinds of t tissue, mainly. It has um, the epithelium of the secretory components. And you see the lumen and the epithelium should be familiar to you by now. And then you have connective tissue, but you have two kinds of connective tissue. You have loose connective tissue. You can see the fibers are um, scattered and um, the, they're not too densely organized. And then you have dense connective tissue where the collagen fibers are very densely packed and the cell abundance is correspondingly low because of the um, uh, a great abundance of matrix materials. So you can see. And these, the collagen is um, randomly organized in both cases. You have blood vessels. You have endothelium lining the blood vessels. This is cuboidal um, epithelium making up the secretory components. And um, 
And these are fibroblasts. You're mainly looking at the nuclei of, uh, <clears throat> of fibroblasts here. <clears throat> Another blood vessel over here. Here is a, <clears throat> another dense, irregular connective tissue. This is from the dermis. So this is a fibroblast. You can see its nucleus. You can see its cytoplasm. And you can see a lot of collagen between the cells. And because it's an irregular connective tissue, when you cut the fibroblasts, they're not going to all be lined up the same way. These two are. But this, these. This is cut in cross-section. Um, other ones are cut in cross-section. So just the way the uh, fibers are randomly organized, the cells are randomly organized. Yes? Is there any way to tell whether it's sexually reproductive or reproductive? Just say that again? Is there any, any way to tell whether it's sexually reconnected tissue, whether it makes it look like this, or do you need to take a comparison of both to see what kind you of need a, You need a comparison. Um, yeah, yeah, you couldn't look at this and say automatically that, that this was dense connective tissue. Um, but we know where it's taken from. And um, sometimes the staining um, is not totally um, uniform or penetrating. So that um, unlike this case where it's obviously dense connective tissue because everything has been stained. In this preparation, a lot of things haven't been stained. So um, you can't infer that it's uh, dense connective tissue. But I'm telling you it, it is. OK, now here is dense irregular connective tissue in a different place. And it's obvious that this is dense irregular. This is the capsule of the spleen. Um, and um, this is the interior of the spleen. And the main cells here are lymphocytes, but you also have red blood cells. And we'll get into the spleen later in the term. But the important thing here is that this is a connective tissue that's very abundant in type 1 collagen. The connective tissue in the body of the spleen here is reticular connective tissue. And um, that is rich in type 3 collagen. And those fibers, remember, are attached to the cells that produce them. And they form a framework that these uh, lymphocytes can um, uh, adhere to. Okay. And um, another important thing, uh, it's not evident on here, but this dense irregular connective tissue can penetrate down and form um, trabeculae, kind of uh, penetrating um, rods of tissue or um, regions of tissue. So you'll see this dense um, irregular connective tissue elsewhere. It kind of uh, partly subdivides the spleen, not completely, but um, creates sectors. Okay, now here's an electron micrograph of a fibroblast. And um, the nucleus, here's the cytoplasm. There's a, a rough endoplasmic reticulum, very elaborated, because any cell that is secretory, that is producing a lot of extracellular matrix, will have a very prominent endoplasmic reticulum, rough endoplasmic reticulum, uh, which is studied with ribosomes. And um, it also has a Golgi apparatus, also very abundant. Um, with many um, the, uh, vesicles and, and cisternae that package the secreted molecules uh, and al allow them to be exported. Now, you've seen this before. And uh, this is just type 1 collagen. And that's what these cells are making. And there's a whole kind of field and somewhat controversial as to where the processing of the collagen takes place. Remember I showed you that the collagen has to get chopped and cleaved and, and then assembled. And um, it, a lot of it happens external to the cell, but it doesn't happen completely outside the cell. So what do I mean by that? There, there are these um, compartments 
that little folds in the surface of um, cells that are producing type 1 collagen where this processing by these enzymes takes place. So it's kind of e external to the cell but kind of enclosed by um, kind of folds in the cell. So um, there are kind of uh, a thousand papers on the, on the subject and uh, half the people don't agree with the other half. But um, anyway, this is forming um, an irregular connective tissue. If it was forming a regular connective tissue, these fibers would be lined up with each other just the way the fibrils are lined up with each other. But this is an irregular schematic here. Okay, now there is connective tissue present in organs at different levels of hierarchy. So um, this is a muscle, for example, a skeletal muscle. And um, the skeletal muscle, um, as you learned from Dr. Etlinger, the, the cells of the skeletal muscle are very elongated and they have multiple nuclei because they are formed by the fusion of individual cells. But in any case, so this is a muscle fiber which is equivalent which is identical to a muscle cell. And the muscle fibers are wrapped um, by a connective tissue, a loose, loose connective tissue, fibroblasts and a little bit of collagen. And that is called the endomycium. So around each of these muscle fibers is a thin layer of connective tissue, endomycium. But there are bundles of these fibers which are called fascicles. Fascicle just kind of means uh, like a bundle of, uh, of sticks or a bundle of straws or just um, a bunch. And the fascicle is surrounded itself by a connective tissue which is a fairly dense connective tissue. Not, the, not as dense as the capsule of the spleen but, but dense. And that is called the the um, perimyceum, wrapped by perimyceum. So here's two levels of a hierarchy, the loose connective tissue and the denser connective tissue surrounding the bundle. But then you have a bundle of the bundles which forms the whole called the muscle body and that is surrounded by quite a dense connective tissue itself and that's called the epimyceum. Epi means on top of or outside of. Peri means around and endo means within. So that's the hierarchy in muscle. So whenever you see an organ that's made up of, of kind of many subunits, you'll always find connective tissue organizing it and creating a framework for it. Because connective tissue gives mechanical um, integrity, it fills space, and it, it plays a supporting structure, a supporting role. Now here is a nerve. Now the hierarchy in a nerve is somewhat similar, but there's possibilities of kind of making false parallels, which I don't want you to do. So in the nerve, you have an endoneurium. What is the endoneurium wrapping around? It's a loose connective tissue and it's wrapping around these stick-like objects, also a fascicle. But these aren't cells. These are fibers. The, it, for a peripheral nerve, the bodies of the cells are located more centrally, either in the spinal cord or in ganglia. And then they put out long axons to the periphery. And those axons are bundled into nerves. So here, the elements of the fascicle are axons, they're fibers. The fibers are surrounded by something called myelin, a, a fatty material. But then external to that is the endoneurium. So we're looking at a magnification here of a region of this. So you have the endoneurium um, around the axons. But then there are bundles of axons, which are called fascicles. And those are surrounded. This is just a drawn line. But they are surrounded by connective tissue 
that an analogy to the one in muscle is called the perineurium. And then those bundles of bundles are in turn surrounded by the epineurium. Hi similar hierarchy. Okay, any questions about this? Yes. Yes. So each of these black dots is the cytoplasm of an axon, of a single axon. So there are multiple axons. And if we looked in one of these little regions here, OK, that would be um, multiple axons. So this, this is a bundle of axons. Okay. Yes? Yes, it does. Progressively denser. There was a question back there. Yes. The fascicle term for bundle. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay. So um, and now here is a dense regular connective tissue in a tendon. So all the fibers are oriented in one direction. The cells are oriented in the same direction. Um, sometimes, since the cells are a little undulating, you'll cut cells more in a cross-sectional profile. So you'll see a round nucleus. But the nuclei are elongated. And most of them will have elongated profiles. But all the fibers are in the same direction. And Everything here is collagen. This collagen and some proteoglycans, um, some minor collagens, but the most abundant tissue here is type 1 collagen. This is what an elastic connective tissue looks like, stained with a special stain that picks up the elastin. So, these are collagen fibers, the lightly staining ones. But the darkly staining ones are elastic fibers and elastic um, sheets. So that's, that's an elastic connective tissue. And just as a review, just recall that elastin is the stretchy protein. And it snaps back. OK, so now we're going to return to reticular connective tissue. I showed you a schematic yesterday, but this is also a special stain. It's a different stain than the elastic stain, but it picks up type 3 collagen. Okay, And it, it's a stain that's picking up the morphology. It's not, this is not an antibody stain. So we're not looking at an immune stain for type 3 collagen. We could do that, but this is just a classic stain that um, picks up the special organization of type 3 collagen and, and uh, distinguishes it from type 1. So, and you'll see um, in the lab, you'll have preparations like this. Um, so here's the capsule. And um, the capsule of the lymph node is like the capsule of the spleen. This is actually, there is some type 3 collagen um, at the inner portion of the capsule. but if we were to look up here, we just find that the capsule is just type 1 collagen. Here's a trabeculum penetrating down. And the trabeculum also has some reticular fibers sticking to its outside. But the core of the trabeculum is dense, irregular connective tissue, type 1 collagen and fibroblasts. But here's the interesting part for this. Um, for this picture, it, um, you have a lot of type 3 collagen fibers. You have lymphocytes adhering to it. And the, you have a network. There's a, because the cells are touching each other, and the, the collagen fibers don't uh, detach from the cells, you form a network of these type 3 collagen fibers. Okay, so um, that's what it looks like. And um, this is the schematic. And you can see these are the cells. 
and they're making type 3 collagen, these dark lines. And there's a network that kind of co-exists with the network of cells. It's a network of collagen. And here's a lower magnification view, quite nice, showing the reticular connective tissue. And reticular connective tissue are in organs with a lot of um, uh, lymphocytes or cells that would otherwise um, kind of be jumbling around, like the bone marrow. Um, you have in the bone marrow, you have a lot of uh, blood producing cells, and the, um, the matrix of the bone marrow. Actually, the most prominent tissue in the bone marrow is fat, but it's in a matrix, uh, connective tissue matrix, that is a reticular matrix. And the spleen also, as I showed you before, um, the, um, the body of the spleen is also reticular connective tissue. Fibronectin, we talked about yesterday, and fibronectin is present in tissues that are undergoing remodeling. So I showed you an example of limb development where fibronectin was mediating the um, ad adhesion of the cells as they formed the cartilage um, that, turn that eventually gets replaced by bone. So that's an example of embryonic morphogenesis. But in the adult body, we have repair, and fibronectin is important in that. Then we have periodic changes, tissue remodeling. So in the um, en endometrium of the uterus, um, the periodic changes and the sloughing off of the tissue um, monthly uh, is um, mediated by a lot of fibronectin matrix. So here, the brown stain is an immune stain for fibronectin. And it's very abundant in the connective tissue of the, um, uh, the stroma. Stroma is a term that's used for connective tissue. You have a parenchyma, which is like the, the business end of the tissue. If it's a gland, it's the secretory cells. If it's the spleen, it's the immune cells, the, the lymphocytes. That's, that's the parenchyma. The stroma is the supporting tissue. And that's generally connective tissue. So the endometrial stroma is very rich in fibronectin. And uh, then the tissue gets sloughed off and replaced. Um, and here's the epithelium of the endometrium. Laminin we've seen before. And if we look at the distribution, we know that laminin is in the basal lamina. Um, and here is an epithelium, a stratified squamous epithelium. And you can see that line of laminin in the base of lamina. But this is also subcutaneous fat. This is um, skin. This is subcutaneous fat. And the fat cells are a specialized connective tissue cell, but they have um, a basal lamina around the fat cells. And these cells, they look vacant, but they have within them um, a large lipid droplet. And the lipid, unless you use special preservatives, the lipid is extracted during histological preparation. But what remains behind uh, is the nucleus, a thin layer of cytoplasm, and the laminin around each of these fat cells. Okay, so now this is a mesentery. And as I said before, the mesentery is, um, is the connective tissue. It's a kind of a filmy, loose connective tissue that attaches parts of the viscera to the body wall. And um, in the lab, those of you who have been in the lab already um, for the epithelium, we're looking at the stomach. We have the omentum. The omentum is part of this mesentery system. It's, it's associated with the stomach uh, preparation. But the mesentery <clears throat> is a, because it's a, not a very dense tissue, although it's very populated with, with blood vessels and cells, it's a piece of tissue that you could actually hold up to the light and the light will pass through it. So you can actually take this tissue and instead of 
sectioning it the way we do with other tissues. Instead of embedding it and cutting it into slices and looking at that thin profile, we could take a piece of the tissue and just squash it between a slide and a cover slip. You could fix it lightly, you could put a stain on it, but you can look at it in, in a kind of almost three-dimensional um, view. You can see whole cells just kind of squashed down. And a lot of the structure remains intact. And it's uh, very instructive to look at it. So this is a whole mount, or spread, it's called, of the mesentery. And what are we looking at here? So there's a lot of connective tissue, and it's extracellular matrix. A lot of these cells are fibroblasts. It's kind of hard to say which ones exactly. You'd have to look a little closer. But there are also many immune cells. There are lymphocytes with very round nuclei. And then there are plasma cells, cells that are stimulated lymphocytes, um, that stimulated B cells that are making antibody because the mesentery has a lot of uh, immune surveillance. There are blood vessels. There are um, very there are capillaries, and then there are venules and arterioles. Um, this is probably an arteriole, and this is a venule. Um, there are mast cells. Mast cells are attached to blood vessels and have granules in them. And the granules um, mediate um, inflammation and the immune response. And they have um, the granules contain histamine and heparin. Heparin is an anticoagulant. So if there's injury, you don't want clotting uh, in an kind of uncontrolled fashion. You want to control it. And histamine um, kind of quells, it, it, uh, it kind of uh, attracts um, uh, other cell types and, and uh, it mediates allergic responses. So um, anyway, in order to interpret this, you can look at this in great detail and you can come up with an interpretation. And um, so we know that there are fibroblasts and there's type 1 collagen and there are lymphocytes, and there are um, plasma cells, which are um, activated lymphocytes, and um, there are um, mast cells with granules in them. This is adipose, white fat, eosinophils, which are mediating um, uh, inflammation, and um, elastic fibers, arterioles, venules, and so on. So um, you can see that these, this mesentery is a very uh, complex loose connective tissue. And the characteristic cells of the connective tissue, the fibroblast, only make a, a partial contribution. There are many other cell types there. And there are also lymphatics. I don't know if that is shown here, but there are the open circulation of the lymphatic system is also uh, richly represented. Okay, this is a macrophage. <clears throat> a macrophage is a large cell that wanders, wanders around and ingests um, broken down red blood cells, but also bacteria. It's a scavenger cell. And it has a large nucleus, and it has particles that are due to its ingestion, and those particles are broken down uh, in the cytoplasm and recycled, and, and uh, the macrophages are quite important for scavenging. Um, macrophages are not only, they sound like they're kind of very helpful to us, but they're also harmful. In, in um, uh, tumors, macrophages often promote uh, tumor invasion. So th there's a kind of a double-edged sword, and there may be more than one kind of macrophage. Okay, mast cells. Um, this is a light micrograph. Here's an EM. These are collagen fibers here with the stripes. And these particles, some of them have heparin, which is the anticoagulant. And these um, particles get um, uh, degranulated, it's called. They, they're exocytotic granules, and they get expelled when the cell is stimulated. And this heparin keeps the blood flowing. 
histamine uh, mediates allergic responses. So uh, one of the things that you take if you have over allergic response is antihistamine, right? Yes. You know, uh, each mast cell carries histamine and heparin, but the granules only have one. Okay, now here is fat. These are adipocytes, and um, this is called white fat, and it has this large um, open space which is occupied by, um, yes, They release, they release the granules, but the cell is still a living cell, and it, it lives to, to fight again. Okay. So, um, okay, so this is white fat, and we're born with a certain number of white fat cells. Um, if, you, if you take on uh, weight, your fat cells get fatter. They don't get more abundant, they get fatter. Um, fat cells can be surgically removed from the body, but otherwise they're, they're always white fat. Um, there's a, it's a vascular tissue. As I said, it has a basal lamina. Um, and there are fibroblasts in among the fat also. And there are stem cells. Okay. And um, because there's one location, it's called unilocular, like one location for the lipid. Um, but there's another kind of fat, brown adipose, and it is multilocular. So you have many little lipid droplets. And so it looks different. And it emerges during development from a, a somewhat different lineage. There's a common mesenchymal precursor, but then the lineages diverge. And these are two different kinds of, of fat, although um, the, there are stem cells present in, in deposits of white fat that seem to be able to give rise to brown fat or brown fat-like cells. Um, and the other thing about brown adipose is that it has the highest number of mitochondria of any cell in the body. It's very abundant in mitochondria. But the mitochondria are unusual in that they make a protein that is not present in any other cell in the body. And that protein is called uncoupling protein 1 or thermogenin. It's, it's synonymous. And, um, if you, uh, when you hear about the mitochondria, you'll learn that there's a process of oxidative phosphorylation. I'm sure you know about this already. Oxidative phosphorylation, which uh, normally produces ATP, which is used for um, running metabolic processes and biosynthetic processes in the body. But in the case of brown fat, this process is uncoupled. There's an uncoupling of oxidative phosphorylation, there is um, a leakage of protons because of UCP1. It provides a channel, and um, it, protons leak, and therefore the um, protomotive um, gradient cannot generate, and you don't get production of ATP. So, um, so this is unusual, and um, people are interested, how do you P1 to be um, induced in other connective. This is fading. Can everybody hear me? Okay. Um, so, how do you get UCP1 to be produced by other cells, maybe, so that we can kind of break down um, what we eat and turn it into heat? Because that's what happens when you uncouple oxidative phosphorylation, you generate heat, hence thermogenin generating heat. Now, here is a white adipocyte. It's a fairly early stage of development. And here's the lipid droplet, nucleus. The nucleus and the cytoplasm are pushed to the side. Here's a brown adipocyte. Um, 
here's uh, nucleus central, and you have mitochondria, and you have these multilocular fat droplets. But many, many, many mitochondria. Here is an infant, and here are the deposits of brown fat. Infants have more brown fat as a proportion of their body than adults do. Brown fat is more or less lost in the adult. Our skeletal muscles generate heat um, and other tissues of the body, just the larger mass generates heat. You don't need as much brown fat, but it's good to have it. And adults do have some brown fat. It doesn't all go away. The, the lighter areas are um, kind of um, partial deposits, that, that kind of uh, dilute deposits of brown fat, and the dark areas, the black areas, are high concentrations of brown fat, but it's all brown fat. So here's an experiment. Um, two different people. This is a lean person under thermoneutral conditions, and we're looking at PET scanning, and where it shows up dark is where um, there is brown fat tissue activity. Okay? And here's a lean person exposed to cold. It turns out when you're exposed to cold, um, some cells in your body that don't ordinarily seem like brown fat become functionally brown fat. It's called beige fat. And it's, not, um, uh, it's kind of a conditional response. And they produce um, UCP1 or thermogenin, and they become active, and you generate heat in response to the cold. But if you take um, an obese person and expose them to cold, you see that there isn't this functional response. So um, whatever um, kind of latent brown fat they have in the body or beige fat is not elicited. So there's something physiological, and that contributes to adiposity or obesity. Yes? Well, they may compensate in certain ways, but they may not. They, but there, there, there is the, pres the problem of obesity, and it's and concurrent. Their, lots of their, brown fat is just as good as their, their brown fat is just as good to generate heat. Well, the brown fat, it's, uh, the rest of the tissues don't dissipate fuel in the form of heat. And therefore, uh, the uh, fuel, the food that you eat, gets stored as adiposity. OK, so here is an experiment from just a month ago that I pulled across when I was preparing this talk. And there's a process called browning of white fat. So actually, this um, cold response, um, some stem cells within white fat can be browned. Um, and this is, could be a longer term thing. And this was an experiment um, where mice, white fat was taken from a mouse and put into, cut up into pieces and put into, it was incubated time in, in factors, growth factors uh, that we know uh, from other experiments elicit this browning response. And the cells. Um, some of the white fat cells became brown fat-like, and then that was put back into the, into the mouse. So does this work? So actually, here are the, the experimental results. Here is white fat, and they're looking for, this is an H&E stain, and they're looking for UCP1. They don't find it, okay? But they, they take the cells and they put it in browning media, and they look for UCP1, there's plenty. So the UCP1 is elicited in the browning media. And here, uh, just some assays that show that the cells are not, um, they're surviving equally. Um, it's just that they're differentiating into brown fat from the white fat. Okay, so um, um, you can look at this paper, it's quite interesting. But the point that I want you to take is that the 
medium is causing this browning response. And the people who wrote the paper had this figure. This is, the, this is what they're aiming towards, where you take um, a, a person and you harvest white adipose tissue, W-A-T, white fat, and you convert it to brown fat, and then you inject it back into subcutaneously. And then they're in a condition where if they eat, their fuel is dissipated into heat and not simply stored. So these experiments are pointing towards this kind of uh, therapy. Yes? Why does the browning occur? Oh, um, there are a bunch of um, a bunch of uh, growth factors um, like uh, cytokines. Uh, I don't have the list in the paper, and it's um, it's nothing that um, it would be if you just in, try to ingest that or inject it or to that population outside of the body and put the cells back when they're free of the factors, just the differentiated cells. Yeah, that probably was. We could, we could talk about that. So, um, yes? Can you just say it louder, please? It can. It, it, it can. You can go back and forth. Um, OK. Um, yeah, wh why don't we take questions? You can come up now, because people are going to the lab. I'll be here for a few minutes. <laughs> this is dense, irregular here. The, the capsule and the trabecular. So this is it. reticular connective tissue. Okay. So yeah, like, it won't be able. Like, I can I wasn't able to tell if it's dense or loose in there. I want to be able to Well, these two. This is standing differently than this.